Chapter 7 Rob had waited in agony for Sue to go to bed and go to sleep. She had stayed up late, as usual, enlivened and playing with her new little buddy. He had just lain in the bed, letting the sounds of their joyfulness echo through the apartment. He had enjoyed what he had heard when he had paid any attention to it. For the most part, though, he was unable to focus on anything other than his almost debilitating state. He had not tried to tune any of their raucous interactions out. He had just tried to leave his body to get a break from the overpowering feeling. It hadn't worked. He could not just drift off into blissfully unaware sleep. Surgeons could do horrible, barbaric butchering to one's body while it was forced into a deep sleep. He wished he had some anesthesia to give him a moment of peace. He stayed in the bed, in that limbo of pain, trying to drift off for hours. It hadn't worked, but at least he had gotten some rest. He needed a bit of downtime as well, but what he really needed more was to be rid of the urge that was coursing through him. Finally, the apartment went silent and stayed silent. It was after three o'clock in the morning. The day had finally run its course. It had been a long one, but a productive one, even more so than he had counted on. He couldn't appreciate the gifts the day had brought, though. He was too distracted by the pain. It was indescribable. It was like every muscle was tensing up while his brain was telling him to use those muscles to rip something apart. He felt strengthened and weakened at the same time. The source of the feeling was in his gut, even in his instinctual one, not just the one that digested whatever he swallowed. He had to get out of bed and do something about it. His head felt light, like he was about to lose consciousness. He had lost consciousness recently and he hated the recuperation it required. His brain, that felt like it was shutting down, was giving him an impulse to go out. The chemicals that were engulfing his cerebrum were promising to not shut down if he provided for them. He knew he had to go out. He was being driven. The choice was being made by his body, his new body. It did not feel like an improved one. The silence out beyond his bedroom door remained, encouraging him to get up at last. There had been no way he could subtly sneak past Sue and go out into the night. She would ask questions, too many questions, and he was not in the position to be creative enough to lie. He did not even trust himself to be able to steady his own voice enough not to worry her. He also did not trust himself to even gaze at her the way he felt. She was tucked in for the night. There was no way she would still be up and it be that quiet. He opened the door slowly and peeked out. She had left the living room lamp on. There was no sign of her. He kept waiting for her to pounce on him in an overly exuberant state of high spirits. He was glad she had them. In a way, he felt responsible for them. He just did not want her to see him in his condition. He would have to tell her something more, eventually, but that could wait until after he felt more up to it. He stepped out into the living room and noticed her bedroom door was open a crack. He felt the suspense again of her lurking somewhere in the distant shadows in the apartment, waiting to pounce and pester and question and tempt. He noticed the bathroom door was open, and the light in there was off. Where else could she be? He put his hand flat-palmed on her bedroom door and began to lightly push it open. He barely recognized his own fingers. They were so thick and the cuticles were about halfway up the nails. They had grown in the brief hours he had struggled with his pain in the bedroom. How fast was he changing? What would he look like the very next day? He pushed the door softly until the far-off lamplight from the living room shone across the bottom of the bed. She was in it. She was curled up. She was sound asleep and breathing heavily. Rosemary was curled up into her chest, and Sue had her arm draped over her. He felt his heart throb at the sight. She looked so peaceful at last. He had not seen her that way in a very long time, if ever. He gently pulled the door back to where it had been. He realized she had left it open for Rosemary, in case she needed to use the litter box in the living room and get to her food and water bowls in the kitchen. He sighed with relief that he would be undisturbed. He was already dressed. Earlier in his bout of torment, he had gotten dressed from his clothes in the suitcase to be ready to give himself some relief at the earliest possible moment. He felt better being up on his feet. The pain sank away from his head, but the drive remained there. The urge in his gut was still there, too, as well as the ache. He was dressed in his usual attire of jeans and a t-shirt. He had on a tight leather jacket that he found for cheap at a thrift store, since the night air was chilly. He was also wearing a bandana with skulls and crossbones on it. He already had it, and usually used it as a handkerchief to blow his nose into when his sinuses acted up, but that night it was wrapped around his bald head. It was pulled down low and cast a shadow over his eyes. It was still up high enough for him to use all his peripheral vision. He might need it. He felt better being a bit more covered for a few reasons. He was still feeling insecure and uncertain of his new looks. The more covered he was, the less grotesque he felt. 
The night air in the desert climate could really get bitterly cold and fast without warning. The bandana would help warm his hairless head and the tops of his ears. It would also help keep anyone from really being able to see him and report him later. He had everything he needed, which was just himself and his keys. He didn't even want to have his wallet with him. He didn't want to have his identification on him, just in case. He opened the main door to the apartment, locked it behind him, and went out into the night. Rob took Sue's car again. He needed to get some distance between where he would be and where he lived, but only a little bit. Every block in L.A. was another world from the blocks around it. It was a city where limos drove next to station wagons that were filled with the belongings of the drivers that lived in them. Where he was going was only several blocks away, but it was also several worlds away. He remembered that world with nothing but resentment. When he had first moved out to L.A., he had been lucky not to spend any nights on the street. He had hopped off the Greyhound around nine o'clock at night, right in the heart of downtown. The scent of urine on the streets stung his nostrils. He was disappointed and offended the moment he had arrived in the big city. A homeless man spotted him and told him that was a bad area to be around at that time of night. He had suggested Rob hail a cab. Rob did and said thank you to the man, although he was going to get a cab anyway. The homeless man told Rob that he had to give him some money for giving that advice. Rob, who wasn't sure how long his funds would last until he got a job, just sighed and got in the taxi and told the driver to take him to the Hollywood area. While they sped away, the homeless man screamed obscenities after him. The cab driver dropped him off at a motel. Rob had gone and gotten a newspaper at the corner and found an ad for a hotel that cost $180 a week to live at. The next day he hopped on a bus, and that was when he realized the cab driver had dropped him off in Koreatown instead. Rob had just shaken his head at how lousy things had been going since he had arrived. The bus took him to Hollywood for real. It seemed as good a locale as any for trying to start dreams and make them come true. He had no desire to act or be a musician. He just wanted to live in a city that was fueled by young blood and where impossible dreams came true. His dream was just to escape his home and become in total control of his destiny. He wanted to get a steady job but not a career. He could keep his options open in a city like L.A. He wanted to get a place that he owned to live in, eventually. He just wanted to live simply. New York would have been too cold, as would Chicago, and Miami was nowhere near far enough away from home. L.A. was it. He checked into the St. Francis Hotel. They asked for the week's pay up front. He had been glad to pay it. He had his own address, at least for a little while. He had been prepared to live on the streets if necessary. The hotel provided shelter, but Rob certainly got what he paid for. Homeless people had a shantytown in the alley underneath his window, and every morning at sunup, they would begin breaking bottles into bins to collect the recycling money. The hotel also had an entertainment strip attached to it. On one side was an adult bookstore. On the other was a bar. The bar had one loud sound system that would blast until almost three o'clock in the morning. That left a quiet two to three hour gap where he would listen to the wailing sirens in the distance before the awfully loud bottle breaking began and continued throughout the day. He got shelter but no sleep. He got a job just as funds were almost out within two months at a telemarketing center that required him to be there at 6 a.m. to begin making cold calls. He had been at Basket Case. Seven months later, near downtown, he was able to afford an apartment and the deposit, and he had lived in it until he began staying with Sue. Outside of the hotel was always the worst kind of degenerates. There were tore-up hookers who allowed their pimps to beat them right there on the street. There were drug dealers constantly asking what you needed. It was also a notorious gang territory. There were shootouts and drive-bys and police helicopters circling overhead with their spotlight that had shined through Rob's blinds on a regular basis. It was a despicable area. It was the perfect place for Rob to go. He would surely find someone there. He pulled the car onto a side street and parked. He got out and scowled at the neighborhood. It was still the same even after the few years that went by. No one was doing anything about it. He would do something. He would leave the homeless people in the alley alone. They already had it hard enough. He would keep an eye out for a real asshole. One would surely not be hard to find. He walked past the catcalls from the prostitutes. They were just trying to make a living. Then he wondered if the drug dealers were just doing the same. They were less sympathetic, but their clients were usually as consenting as the Johns were. There weren't too many people out at that late hour. The bar had already closed, and that had been when the peak hours for the whores and the druggies began. Time was hitting that weird limbo between when the people of the night reigned and the early birds got up to begin their productive day. It was all in a state of flux. That was fine, because so was Rob. He needed somebody, but he didn't want too many others around. He had cruised the blocks in the area a few times with the hunger growing inside of his core. It felt like it was fueling his pursuit rather than draining his energy by that time. He was starting to wonder if he would find anybody suitable. 
That was when someone drunkenly yelled out at him, What the fuck do you think you're doing in this neighborhood, gringo? A voice with a Mexican accent slurred. Rob turned and saw three guys come out from behind a bush that was covering that section of the sidewalk. The streetlight above was out. There was a pair of sneakers dangling from the electrical wires. By their laces, Rob could still see the guys just fine without the light. Just going for a walk, he replied. You better take a walk somewhere else before I fuck you up, white boy. You think you're a badass with your bandana, Holmes? I'm the badass around here. He stepped into the street. He was wearing a gray jacket, and he pulled its hood off his own bald head. It had a spiderweb tattoo all over the scalp. He was holding a Corona bottle, but when Rob didn't answer him, he threw it at him. The glass broke around Rob's feet on the pavement. Rob actually jumped a little. He had not been expecting something so directly confrontational. He sized up the guy and continued walking. Yeah, that's right, pussy. Stay the fuck off my turf. The other two guys with him were shouting at Rob in Spanish. Rob went back to the car and drove over to the vicinity of that street. He was parked about two blocks away. They were around the corner and out of sight, but Rob knew they were there. He got out of the car and went to the edge of a building on the corner of the street. He snuck a peek around it. They were definitely still there. He could see their slight movements in the shadows. He could barely hear their voices. He couldn't make out anything they were saying. He waited there while his gut lurched and churned with anticipation. He was hungry, and it was scared of what was going to happen. A car pulled up beside him. There was a middle-aged man in a white-collared shirt driving it. "'What are you doing out here?' the man asked him offhandedly. "'Nothing.' Rob dismissed him, but he was not watching the guys anymore. He was staring at the man in the car, waiting for him to reveal himself to be a cop or just go away. "'You want to make a little money?' He flashed a hundred-dollar bill at Rob. "'You want to get the fuck out of here before I just take that cash from you?' Rob snarled at him. The man startled and drove away quickly. Rob was pleased with the sound that had come out of his throat. It sounded like a dog growl. It had gotten the job done, too. He turned back around and saw the group of guys parting their ways. They were staggering off in different directions. The head honcho was walking right towards him. Rob recognized his tattooed head when it passed under a lit street lamp. He couldn't believe his luck. Rob walked the alley between the brick building on the corner that he had been peeking around and the one next to it. He waited there. Soon the leader of the pack was at the corner. Rob watched him from the dark. The guy paused there for a moment, and then began crossing the street. Hey! Rob called out to him. The guy stopped in the middle of the street and turned around. He squinted, trying to make out who had made that noise. Who's that? Rob stepped out into the light on the edge of the alley. The guy's face lit up with recognition. Oh, it's you, white boy. You want to do something? You want to get back at me? He held his arms out and gestured with his fingers that he should come over already. Rob just stared at him. What the fuck do you want? Say something! He sized Rob up. Maybe you're too scared now, huh? Maybe you're a little faggot and you want to suck my big brown uncut dick. Is that it, white boy? Rob stepped back into the shadows. Come over here so I can kick your ass and choke you with my fat white cock, motherfucker. The guy just laughed. You want to play? Well, let's play. He approached the alley. Whatever was in Rob just took him over completely. He grabbed the guy by the jacket and pulled him into the alleyway. Before the guy could cry out, Rob kicked his feet out from under him. His head cracked on the cement. Rob kneeled down and grabbed his head in both hands and pounded it into the concrete several more times until the head began to feel soft. A puddle began to slowly give the body a halo of blood. Rob then grabbed the guy's left arm and peeled back the jacket sleeve. He bit into it and shook his head and wrenched it back with chunks of flesh in his teeth. It was warm, and when he swallowed it, the sensation in his gut felt a little better and a little stronger. He would make it all better. He took another bite. He would know when he was done. He wasn't controlling his actions anymore. He was following pure instinct. It felt good, like he was in touch with something greater than himself. He obeyed it. It felt right. He took a moment to get his breath before he resumed devouring the guy. He looked up at the piece of night sky that he could see between the building's walls. He could see the stars sparkling. He wanted to roar, but he could not risk being heard, even if what he was doing was meant to be. His eyes felt hot and his face was sticky from being covered in blood. He opened his mouth and licked his teeth. While staring up at the seemingly infinite sky, he let out a sound of breath, like any kid makes when they pretend that a crowd is cheering for them. Rob watched the cloud of his hot breath slowly rise up and dissipate into the cold night.